Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session, ATE Primer Part 1, EUT Power and Excitation. I'm John Simasic, the Director of Marketing at Marvin Test Solutions, and I'll be your host today. I was a test engineer for many years with companies including Northrop Grumman, Westinghouse, and Daimler Chrysler, and I think you're going to find today's session both informative and useful moving forward. So the type of topics we're going to talk about today, we'll start off with a brief introduction of Marvin Test Solutions. We'll take a look at ATE core subsystems, see how the primary power plays into that, take a look at UUT power requirements, and then we'll take a look at some of the other aspects of tests that we need to be concerned with, including path resistance, applications where source measure units make sense, some digital test power considerations that we may not be uh, aware of um, on a on a day-to-day -day basis and then we'll look at uh, reference sources and how that plays into the whole certification and calibration of the entire test system so we're part of the marvin group Mar marvin engineering company is the largest u.s-based aircraft armament equipment manufacturer and supplier things like pylons bomb racks ejector racks and so forth then we have land systems which primarily produces auxiliary power units and vehicle environmental systems. Then, of course, Marvin Test Solutions. Well, we're a test house. We focus primarily on test hardware, both instrumentation and systems, as well as software. And we'll see a little bit more about that in the next slide. So we're a vertically integrated test solutions leader. Now, exactly what do we mean by that? And, and if you take a look at the right hand of the screen, it, it essentially says it all. We, we design and manufacture switching and instrumentation both in a 3U and 6U PXI and PXIE format, which then feeds into our subsystems, which you can see on the right-hand side of the images, and then all, all the way to very large test systems in the neighborhood of 4,500 uh, test points pulled out to the ITA at every resource to every pin. And then we, we do quite a bit with the O-level and I-level test systems for the, the military and, and aircraft. And you can see we have a couple of ruggedized test systems, including the, the smart can up above. And then we can't forget the software. We actually have the, the most cyber secure um, test executive and integrated development environment on the market. Now, we're, we're a customer-centric aerospace and manufacturing and test company. That, that, that's, that says a lot, but what it is means, it, essentially it means we, we listen to our customers and we design solutions that best meet the mission critical nature of those applications. And, and that's a key part of our relationship with the customers. We're globally deployed. And, and a key part of this is the fact that we have unrivaled long-term support. It's interesting, for those of you who have been in the the industry for a while, we actually will supply ISA cards. And, and if you think about when ISA cards were introduced, you can you can put timeline on our on how serious we are about our support. And, and I don't want to forget the fact that we're an AS 9100D certified company. And that's something that really sets us aside from the standpoint of being a, a test and measurement supplier, because very few customers uh, go to the lengths of being certified with the AS 9100D certification. Let's take a look at ATE core subsystems now. This isn't any surprise to anyone, right? We, we have the, the basic building blocks here. We have analog, scopes, analyzers, ARBs, those types of things. And then the digital side of it, both static and dynamic. And then the piece that essentially ties everything together, the switching subsystem, whether it's low frequency, high frequency and RF, or, or our power. And, and while this is all great, without our power subsystem, we can't do a whole lot. So if we take a look at the power subsystem, we have essentially two pieces. We, we have the, the primary end of it is what I'm referring to, and that, that includes things like power distribution, UPSs, uh, proper grounding and so forth. And then the UUT side of it, which focuses more on supply rails, being able to provide bias voltages, uh, set conditions for the unit under test. And then we need to, again, understand how path resistance plays into this and supplying the correct voltages to the unit under test and when source measure functionality plays into it. So now we'll take a closer look at our test system primary power. Test system primary power incorporates several things of We'll start off with grounding. When we think of grounding, oftentimes it's it's almost 
thought of nonchalantly. Okay, yes, we, we need the ground. Let's put a safety ground in there and so forth. But if you've ever struggled with ground loops, you realize that the grounding can be a key part of our test system. And, and ground loops occur when you have different potentials on your, uh, for example, the power strips that you see on the, the bottom uh, half of the screen here. You can actually have two power strips very close together and you can have different ground potentials between those two, which generates ground loops and that can interfere with our uh, precise measurements in, in our instrumentation. Power distribution is a key part of any AC, any AC power distribution system and we're going to see uh, some of the, the components of that in just a couple minutes. Power conditioning and regulation. We need to ensure that the power getting to our test system is clean, that we're protecting against spikes and those types of things. And then we'll see well, when does it really make sense to incorporate UPSs into what level? Uh, sorry, jumped one ahead. So if we take a look at the system power distribution unit, generally speaking, it, it has the AC mains, right? Power sequencing, those types of things. Oftentimes it has input filters. Um, in the, the objective there is to reduce interference, EMI and RFI. Surge suppression is definitely a key part of our power distribution unit because even though we may be in a very uh, in a facility that has very clean power, you still have external events that can contribute to to getting spikes and surges in the line. For example, lightning strike or potentially an accident and the power pole gets knocked down and, and we blow a transformer, things like that. So we need to make sure that we can protect against the surges not just protect the instrumentation in our test system, but it's just as critical to be able to protect that unit under test. And then it, it, your PDU also incorporates uh, standard functionality such as uh, power fault indicators. We need to keep track of the thermals within the system. So oftentimes it includes that with warnings. And, and let's not forget the all important emergency power off that, that old test statements need to have. Now, from the standpoint of UPSs, there, there's a lot of different philosophies, and depending on the test system at play, you may utilize different types of systems. But if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, we, we go from a UPS that's essentially designed for a desktop computer all the way up to multi-base systems that can power entire test systems for hours. But exactly what we what do we need and what does it do for us? Well, as I mentioned, we're, there are instances where you lose power, where facility power may hiccup, where you may have um, issues with your supplier. For example, in California, rolling brownouts are not uncommon throughout the hotter months of the year. So we need to be able to provide protections against that. The UPS gives us that nearly instantaneous response and provides backup power to the system. But what do we do once we have that? Well, essentially that gives us the time to gracefully shut our system down. So A, we don't damage the UUT, and B, we gracefully uh, bring all of our sources and power down so that we don't damage anything internal to the test station either. So most modern UPSs provide a communications output that allows us to monitor that. And once we see, uh, once we get a trigger that we've had a power fault, we can gracefully pull, shut down the UT, pull our stimulus off of it, pull the rails off, and then gracefully shut down the test system. So it's it's not such that we can continue to run our tests for the next three hours when I have the UPS running. It's more to protect the system, test system, protect our UUT, gracefully power down. Let's look at some of the UUT power requirements now. So we, we took a look at the AC end of it, all the, the power distribution and so forth. Now we'll move into the UUT side. So we have a number of types of UUT power requirements in, in activities that take place, including supply rails, very common, bias voltages, um, it, depending on the type of devices that we're testing, parametric test functionality, as well as source measure units. We, we need to be concerned about test condition simulation. What does the UUT, UUT expect to see and what type of conditions do we need to provide to ensure that you get the correct responses out of that line replaceable unit? And then reference standards, we'll talk about that a little bit, but that is primarily to give us our capability if we choose to have our 
in in-house uh, certification system for our test system. Now, when, when we look at defining our requirements from the standpoint of UET power, and, and this may seem obvious to, to some of us on the call, but we, we need to understand what we're gonna test first of all. If, if it's a small test system that's just gonna focus on circuit card assemblies, it's pretty straightforward as far as understanding what those power rails are, the type of stimulus we need to provide and so forth. But as we move those circuit card assemblies into sub-assemblies and line replaceable units, as you can see on the lower right hand side of the screen, the complexity greatly increases. So that's where we need to take a much closer look at the requirements in our power budgets. And for example, it's not uncommon to, to have to do halt has testing. Done, done this many times in the past and that requires parallel test capabilities. And oftentimes it's just not a matter of putting a UUT into an oven and cycling it and maybe shaking it a little bit, but we might actually want to exercise, exercise it at, at the limits in, at various points throughout that temperature and vibration cycle. So being able to provide those parallel test requirements is, is critical. And of course that adds to our power budget. And then as we take a look at, again, at that image on the right hand side of the screen bottom, you can see we have our ITA, our interface test adapter. And oftentimes those ITAs actually contain active circuitry. I, I know many times, you know, often the goal is to not have any active circuitry in the ITA, but requirements change, uh, testing needs change, and rather than going in and modifying the entire test system, once you have a good core, it may make sense to just put active circuitry into that ITA, and that all becomes part of our budget as well for UET power requirements. So again, I mentioned parallel testing for um, halt hats, and on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a good example of that. But, but we need to define that power budget, and by defining the power budget, Probably the most straightforward thing is understanding the power range rails and the voltage and current requirements for that. Pretty straightforward. And typically we base that on our worst case UUT or LRU requirements in conjunction with the active ITA piece of it. And then we also always want to include a safety factor, uh, both for future expansion, but but, but for um, other, other aspects of testing as well. And typically that's going to be in, in the 20% range. So essentially we identify the power range, the power rails, understand what kind of excitation needs we need, and then we put a safety factor on top of that. And then when we think about our test system in, in, as a whole, if you think about the cabling, just the cabling, a larger test system like the, the TS-323 that we, we looked at in the beginning of the presentation, it's not uncommon at all to have tens of feet of cabling. You're going to be going through relays. You have all types of interconnects. And while those resistances for all those various points may seem small individually, depending on the size of the test system and the signal we have to provide, it can give us um, some headaches as far as uh, path losses and voltage drops. So that's when we may need to consider the need for Kelvin type um, sourcing using sense lines. So as we look at the UUT supply rails, again, may, may seem pretty straightforward at this point, but, but we have fixed outputs, both current and voltages um, for the, the various devices. And we can supply that with, it could be a rack mounted power supply. It could be power supplies like we see on the right that are chassis mounted or even power interfaces for lower current applications. And then we have variable output needs, again, voltage and current. But when it comes to the variable outputs, oftentimes slew rates come into play. So we need to understand that. We need to understand if our power interface and our power device has the capabilities to react quickly enough to meet the needs of the unit under test. And when you think about that, it could be D to A's as well, digital analog converters and what the slew rates are there. And then from a power on sequencing standpoint, obviously we just don't apply power to our UUT and hope everything goes right. We, oftentimes there are, are very uh, well-defined power up sequences and we need to make sure that we follow those so we, we apply this 
rail first and then the second rail and, and those types of things uh, before we apply any type of excitation to the unit under test itself. And then if we think about from the standpoint of simulating those operational conditions, so for example, the line replaceable unit, it's, it's out there and it's interfacing with other, other devices in types of system within an aircraft, for example, it could be a electronic warfare LRU that has to interface with radars, altimeters, uh, different types of uh, systems within the aircraft. So we need to simulate those types of conditions. And oftentimes that is done with some type of precision source um, in A to D, or I'm sorry, a D to A type of application. And another thing we need to keep in mind are potential transducer inputs. Oftentimes it's not just a, a on or off switch that we're simulating, but it could be an input from some type of um, resistive device. And we need to ensure that we can simulate that type of functionality as well. And as we look at the UT from the standpoint of excitation, not power rails, but excitation, then the rise times become more important. Being able to understand the update rates that the power uh, system needs and changes in that, synchronizing all of the various inputs to that LRU. And sometimes that can be troublesome because you may have many, you know, dozens and dozens of inputs and you need to synchronize that across multiple instrumentations. So what's the best way to approach that? And in the, you know, the, the uh, images on the right hand side are part of our, our PXI lineup, which sort of simplifies that whole synchronization piece, but it's still something that we need to keep in mind. Channel densities and of course programmable levels. We need to understand what all those pieces are as we do our, our power budget and our excitation budget for that union under test, keeping in mind that, that we always need to design for that worst case scenario. Now let's understand a little bit more about path resistances. So the, the images on, or the image on the bottom of the screen shows a typical, what I'll call test system, for example, where we're, we're coming out of a card and we're providing a voltage or a power supply, your rack mount power supply, and we're providing this voltage. But we have two um, paths that we have to go through, both source and return. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to have tens of feet of cable between the unit under test that patch panel and the instrument itself. So in addition to that, we also have relays involved because we're switching all these pieces. We also have all of the interconnects, both at the, the source, at the ITA, and at the instrument side as well. So really it is key to understand that entire path, that resistance path to the unit under test. This is a real quick example of how that can be impactful and it is based upon the needs of your LRU or that circuit card you're testing. For example, just randomly pick, so we, we have a source five volts, we're gonna supply five volts, 100 milliamps. And if we take a look at our, our path, if, if we were to have a combined path resistance of one and a quarter ohms, going through the entire system to that UUT, which really isn't outside the question um, when, when you start adding things up. And if we take a look at what those voltage drops are between the two paths, we could potentially lose uh, a, a 250 millivolts of voltage that we wanted to be supplied to the UUT just through our path. So what do we do about that? So it, there may be instances where this isn't a concern. Say, so, okay, great. My, my limits are, you know, it, it's 4.6 to 5.2 volts, whatever the case may be. But very often you can have much tighter requirements. If you need to supply 4.95 volts, we program five volts, we have the voltage drops, all of a sudden my UUT is getting 4.75 volts and we're wondering what's going on. Well, how do we address that? We address it using remote sense or Kelvin connections to our power and or excitation sources. How does this work? Well, if you take a look, it's easy to take a look at the drawing. When, when you look at the drawing, we have the sense lines coming out and those sense lines supply a very small current, very low in the picoamp range, sometimes lower. And you can see that you're gonna have a very minimal voltage drop throughout that path resistance. So essentially, 
the VM is equal to the, the, the VR. So what we see at the sense input is essentially the voltage that we're seeing at the unit under test. So if we, going back to the previous example, we program five volts, all of a sudden I take a look at the sense and it's like, man, I'm getting 4.75 volts. Then we can programmatically tweak our voltage levels until we're compensating for all the path resistances. And indeed I'm getting that exact voltage at the unit under test that I'm expecting. Let's take a look at SMUs and source measure units and when they come into play. Well, what is a source measure unit? Well, essentially it's the primary parametric test measurement resource. And, and it's really key for identifying or for characterizing and testing nonlinear devices, such as uh, semiconductors, those types of things. And, and what do we want to look at? Le leakage and, and breakdown voltages and forward operating characteristics of the device under test. Well, great, but so what? what why is a SMU so important? Well, essentially, a SMU gives us four quadrant operation that you can see on the right hand side in the graph, as opposed to a power supply, which is just two quadrant. And there are some other advantages of using the SMU, and we'll take a look at that in a moment as well. But essentially, a SMU can simultaneously source or sink voltage, measure current, and it can also simultaneously source or sink current and measure voltage. Very, very useful when we're trying to characterize semiconductor devices. So you might say, well, I essentially can do that with a, with a power supply and a DMM as well, right? So if we take a couple uh, devices, in this case, um, a PXI precision source, as well as a six and a half digit DMM, and I want to test um, the, the turn on voltage and leakage current of a diode, yeah, I can do it this way. Essentially what I need to do is set my voltage level uh, below that reverse breakdown voltage, and then I'm going to have my upper level above the turn on voltage, and we're gonna have multiple steps throughout that so I can characterize and understand what's happening with the device and to see if it's actually gonna meet the requirements um, that, that, that I'm looking for. But what are some of the pitfalls of this approach? Well, obviously we have two instruments, and even though in this instance, it is a PXI based system, so we're gonna have very tight synchronization between the cards and the chassis. Still, we're programming two devices. We have to handshake between the two separate devices. And oftentimes with the DMM, you don't have the same accuracies in settling time advantages that you will with the source measure unit. So in this instance, we, you know, the image shows the, the GX3104, which is one of our SMU devices, and you can see the difference in the connectivity. So now, instead of having two instruments, and again, going back to the previous example, if I were to, exam for example, use two benchtop instruments that utilize an LXI Ethernet interface, you can imagine your timing considerations are, are even going to be um, more, more exaggerated because we have communications delays across Ethernet, we have settling times, we have all the synchronization. So incorporating all this functionality into a single multi-channel instrument really is advantageous. It gives us faster test times, lower measurement uncertainties, and as I mentioned, we, we have better lower, lower current capabilities with the SMU, the integration, it clearly is a no-brainer. We're, we're, we're down to just four wires in this case. The simplified, uh, the programming is much simplified. And at the end of the day, your lower cost of ownership as well. So as you're considering these types of tests, look, look at SMUs. SMUs are really a nice piece of instrumentation that, that can be used in a number of different apps. Now we'll take a look at digital test power considerations and, and why that's important. And in this case, well, we're gonna be programming our digital devices for certain outputs, but we also are concerned about the power consumption of that digital instrument itself and how that plays into much larger systems. So a couple of the key things that really drive power consumption when we look at digital devices are the voltage swing and the slew rates across the high voltage swings. It's, it's not out of the question to see 
for example, 2.5 watts per channel. We look at a high channel count system. We're looking at 1,200 watts of power we have to dissipate. And if it's a, a much larger digital system, two kilowatts for a high channel count system is not out of the question at all. So clearly, you know, yeah, I, I could probably cook an egg on, on the top of that surface, but what do I do to try to mitigate some of these issues? Well, one of the things is to have an adjustable slew rate, slew rate control on your digital instrumentation. So if we have the high voltage swings, the application may not necessarily require the high slew rate as well. So as we take a look at our test requirements document, understand really what this unit under test needs. If we can back off the slew rate, we're going to save a significant amount of power and reduce the power consumption. Programmable pin interface electronics is also a key part of this because it allows the slew rate uh, to be optimized for that specific test. So it really is a key part of this. Another key approach is to look at the voltage rail operation of the digital instrumentation you're using. Very often, the voltage rails are set and there's no way to adjust them. So as we look at what's actually, um, what's actually generating the, the the, 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 the power consumption, it's these power rails being set times the quiescent current. So how do we potentially approach this to provide a, a better solution? Well, we take a look at being able to have programmable rails that are closer to the programmable voltage that the unit under test needs. By being able to set the rails lower, we are reducing that baseband, if you will, power consumption, and we're greatly reducing the amount of power that's needed to be dissipated. And of course, I, I mentioned intelligent pin electronics. That, that's a key part of the solution as well because it allows you to reduce power consumption by um, a clever approach we use is by being able to power down the output section without actually affecting the state of the device. So really that's pretty key. So we set a level, we can power down, we can maintain that, again, reducing power consumption. And then parametric test functionality is part of many of the um, higher end dynamic digital devices that have programmable measurement, programmable measurement units employed in them. And if we take a look at the functionality bullets, should look pretty familiar at this point, right? We have DC measurement capability. Oh, we can force voltage, measure current. We can force current and measure voltage. What's that sound like? Sounds like a source measure unit. So essentially, in many regards, we, we get this source measure unit on an independent per channel basis on a multi-channel dynamic digital car. So a really neat functionality. And we're just gonna look at one use case here that one of our customers is doing. And it, they're using this type of card to do cable connectivity pre-power testing. Obviously, we don't wanna just uh, connect everything to our system, especially if it's a sensitive piece of hardware and assume that we can just power on and everything's gonna be fine. So essentially what the customer has done, they, they do a low voltage bias test to verify the cables and connections. They apply a, a constant voltage out of parameter parametric measurement unit, multiple channels of this because of the multiple uh, cable requirements, and then they measure the drawback. If, if we get the correct current re response, we know that we have our path in place and that we have the correct impedance throughout there. We don't have an open, we don't have shorts, those types of things. And it really does put, manage the, the potential damage to the unit under test. So it's a clever way to use a dynamic digital card with a parametric measurement unit to do cable connectivity pre-power tests. Now let's take a quick look at reference sources and what this means to our test system. Most of us who have utilized major test systems in the past, we realize we, we have calibration requirements, we have recertification requirements. And if we're in a situation where we, we don't have a 
supply a backup instrument. So when I send the instrument off to the metrology lab, my test system is down, then that can be a real issue depending on the application and depending on the loading of that particular test system. So being able to have some type of in-system instrument recertification can greatly Im improve our uptime, reduce the time that the instrumentation needs to go out to the cow house, and it also gives us a certain level of self-test functionality. Now, another thing this does for us, it, it, it provides us the ability to have these additional reference sources, again, not just for self-test, but to be able to validate and verify the performance of our instruments within the test system. But there are a couple of things that are required to make this happen. It, it's got to be mistraceable uh, somehow, some way. Um, if it's a reference standard, we, we have to have really, really superior long-term stability and accuracy, as well as low drift components in, in, in incorporated into the unit itself. So as we look at that, what's important to us? Well, we need to understand our test uncertainty ratio. So whatever type of instrument recertification source we're using, it needs to be at least four times more accurate than the device or the instrument that I'm certifying in my test station. And really that's key. So we, we need to take a look at those test and certain ratios, do the math, understand if we're going that we're gonna meet that, and then we can move forward. And then, we also need to ensure that whatever reference instrument source that we're using, that it can be recertified to NIST traceable standards. That's a key part of it. And in the case of the, the example that I'm showing here with our, with our reference source, that can be done just with an external DMM and frequency counter. So you essentially can have this, this recertification source in your test system that can also double as an excitation source for doing self-test. So really you're getting benefits on two fronts with having this type of instrumentation embedded into our test system. Now, now we just have a couple of recommendations. I apologize, I'm three minutes over. We'll wrap up real quickly. But proper grounding is a key part of it. And again, we, many of us, you think of grounding, it's like, all right, it's just grounding. But we, need to, we do need to be concerned about grounding from the standpoint of safety, but also those ground loops. Ground loops will kill you and you can chase ground loops for a long time um, in, in some instances before you really understand what the source of the issue is. Having the flexible excitation sources, obviously from pro for providing the various inputs for the UUTs. Comprehensive on power on tests that we saw where the individual happened to be using uh, one of the dynamic digital cards to do the power on test to, to check the, uh, the, the, the paths before they power up. Understanding our power budgets, um, when do we need to provide some type of sensing option where we have uh, voltage drops throughout the system and we need precise values, voltage values at the UUT. And along with that, the impact that the cables and interconnects give us. And then active power management for, for digital testing. If we're doing a lot of digital testing, we're consuming a lot of power. And having active power management can really, really help, both from the standpoint of just general power consumption, but also heat generation as well. And then th think about the standpoint of having some type of reference instrumentation so you can do in-house certification um, as well as uh, being able to do self-test. And, and that in-house certification, just real quick there too, for the, anyone who's actually pulled apart a test system for calibration, you put it back together, does it always work when you power up first time? H having this in-system in certification eliminates some of the headaches we run into after we cal and then it's, we power up and it's like, oh, I'm failing self-test, now what do I do? So recommendations, if you have issues or concerns, we, 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 we have complementary engineering evaluation and, and we'll provide recommendations. So contact one of our MTS test system experts. That's what we do. We're a test system house and that's what we focus on, both from software with ATEZ and the um, most cyber secure development environment to all the various instruments and switching solutions we have. And for further questions, we have a couple of contacts here, uh, both for US and for European 
uh, contacts, Jim Frain and Victor Fernandez, as well as our Magin MAGIC online support, which is a 24-hour support um, web interface that we have so you can get online, ask your questions, and so forth. And I would like to thank you for joining us for today's session. I hope it was helpful and informative. And you're going to be seeing a follow-on notice for our next um, session, which is going to be on system switching and switching subsystems, which is key to all of us. And really, it is the heart of our test system after we have our power applied. So thank you very much for attending. I appreciate your time. I wish the best to you and your families. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in our next session. If you have any questions, feel free to email me directly, and I will be happy to address them. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day.